We'll move on now to the next session, which indeed uh, Jose has already mentioned some of the things that we're going to be hearing about, but it's a real pleasure to invite uh, Dan Haber, who's known to everybody in the room, uh, to come up and give the next lecture, Dan. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to start by um, give you a bit of an introduction into the biology and technology of isolating circulating tumor cells, and then give you an update on where we stand with some of these technologies. You won't learn anything. And um, this is this is a slide that you've seen then, which kind of summarizes everything that we don't know and don't know about circulating tumor cells. There's a representation of the tumor mass. It's green. And the assumption is that cells leave the primary tumor, intravasate into blood vessels, circulate around in the bloodstream, and eventually leave this bloodstream to give rise to metastases. That's the uh, leading model, and that's pretty much everything that we know about it. So we don't actually know how the cells intravasate into blood vessels. Do they go through a process of epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT, or do they somehow just make it in there? The frequency or prevalence of these cells in the blood is also a mystery. The number that's thrown around is one tumor cell per billion normal blood cells, but that's a guess, and we really don't know what they are. And there's no gold standard in this field, so we see what we pull out. It's a bit like going fishing with a little hook and a particular bait. You get whatever fish actually happens to like your bait, but you don't know what's in the river, and that very much summarizes where we are with this field. And again, we don't really know how these guys actually leave the bloodstream. So other than that, we're doing very well. Um, the field of CTCs has a tremendous amount of hype um, because theoretically you could do everything with CTCs. But I'll try to summarize then three general areas which are the ones that uh, we've been focusing on. And they actually go in a temporal uh, progression from what we think we can do now to what we hope we can do tomorrow and to what we may dream of doing in the future. So I'm going to talk first about metastatic cancer, and that's the idea that we may be able to non-invasively sample blood, uh, tumor cells from the blood and help, those, help us adjust the therapy for patients known to have cancer. I'll touch a little bit on some earlier data in terms of localized cancer and the idea that if these cells can be picked up earlier, if blood vessel invasion is picked up earlier, there is some hope for early detection of vascular invasion, which I think could be very, very promising if the technology can take us there. And then finally, some biological insights, because basically these are the cells that kill. These are the cells that give rise to metastases, or at least a subset of them are, and the more we can understand them, the more we can monitor and target them. So with this in mind, let me start with some technology. There are a lot of different technologies to pull out circulating tumor cells in the circulation, and this is a very rapidly evolving field. Um, the work that I'll talk about today was done in close collaboration with the bioengineer Mehmet Toner, and after one or two beers, Mehmet and I will agree that the only thing we've really accomplished is to juice up the field and have everybody else in the world work on this. So the number of bioengineering labs that are working on approaches to detecting circulating tumor cells is somewhat scary, so then we usually have another beer and don't think about it anymore. Um, but there are a number of good technologies. The commercial one is the one that's shown in blue, and this is a technology that's uh, – it, it's the Veridex system that's marketed by Johnson & Johnson. It involves using an antibody against EPCAM, epithelial adhesion molecule, which is common in epithelial cells, absent in blood cells. The antibody is conjugated with magnetic nanoparticle. A huge magnet is then applied across this field, and cells get sucked out to that part of the tube. It's a very elegant mechanism. It has its, its limitations are the number of steps that it takes in processing so that the yield is relatively small. So about half of patients known to have metastatic cancer will have cells detectable by this technology. And on average, it's about one cell per mil or five cells per 7.5 mils. So it has established the entire field, but the challenge is can we do better in terms of detection. I won't talk about other technologies. There are some that are using density, others that are using size. Most but not all CTCs are larger than blood cells, so there's a filtration approach. Others are rapid scanning approaches where you precipitate all cells and scan the cells um, with very rapid scanning microscopy. And this is the technology that was developed here. This is our first generation chip, which is the one that I'll talk to you about for a little bit. 
So this was developed by Sunita Negrath, a postdoc in Mehmet Toner's lab. And the idea is that in microfluidics, the problem is that cells never touch anything. Everything is in a, in, a, in a streamline. And the cells that are flowing through this microcirculatory device don't touch the walls. So you can put whatever antibody you want on the walls. The cells will not come into contact with it. If, on the other hand, you interrupt the flow stream by having little pillars, and these are, you know, this, is, this chip is about the size of a glass slide. It has 80,000 pillars, each one of which is the width of a human hair. You can see that these, these um, pillars will interrupt the flow of blood, and each of these pillars is then coated with the same antibody to EPCAM. So the cells come into contact with these, and in the ideal world, normal blood cells just flow all the way through unimpeded, and tumor cells or epithelial cells in the circulation are captured and stick to these pillars. You can see again in the ideal world, you can image them uh, by fluorescence antibodies as they are captured on the chips, or you can lyse them, make RNA, DNA, whatever you wish, and then look at particular assays. Um, there are I'm, I'm going through this relatively quickly for a number of reasons, one of which is I have other things to say, the other one is that we don't use this chip anymore. But this was the, bio the beautiful engineering that went into this. This is, um, you're, you're passing two to four mils of blood over two to four hours through one of these microchips. That's about like connecting a fire hydrant hose to um, this pointer. The amount of flow is astronomical for, micro, for microfluidic devices. So a lot of attention went into how to position these posts. In, in fact, there's enough, it's enough of a low shear uh, device that the, sh the calculated shear, strength of str shear stress of blood going through this device is less than blood going through the normal heart valves. On the other hand, if you're too good an engineer, your shear stress is so low that the cells actually never come into contact with the pillars. So because of that, there's actually a staggering of the distance every three posts. There's a staggering of distance to cause just enough turbulent flow to enhance the collisions with the chip. So again, a lot of thought went into this, but a lot of challenges as well. This is what it looks like. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the pillars. This is just a picture of the chip, and this is the very advanced uh, engineering technology that gives you a box that looks like that. But as the engineers are, are, are fond of pointing out, if you put a cover and it has an on-off switch and it says MGH on it, it's amazing how many people want this box. But behind the box, it actually still takes about four hours to process the blood and about four hours to image. Now, this is again, the, this is a lung cancer patient, a, a, a CTC from the first patient with lung cancer that we captured. It's in false color in yellow, but you can see again in this scanning EM capture of the cells. And then you get into the, def the question of definition. How do you define a CTC? How do you know what it is? Well, this is what's in standard in the field now, which is first you stain it to, with DAPI or hoax to make sure it has a nucleus. That's helpful. Then you capture it, obviously, with EPCAM, so you use a second antibody to make sure uh, that it really is an epithelial cell. In this case, we're staining here with cytokeratin. Red means that you're an epithelial cell with cytokeratin. Green means you actually have a white blood cell marker, CD45, so you're a contaminating white cell, and then you merge these. So the standard in the field has been that epithelial cells in the blood are defined as captured with EPCAM, stained with keratin, and negative for blood cell markers. And that's useful, but as I'll, as I'll point out, the field needs to go a lot further in terms of characterizing of what these cells are. This was the probably most interesting result of this first generation chip, which is that the dynamic range was elevated. So we were able to capture CTCs from a number of different patients with different epithelial cancers with a very high frequency. But even more importantly, as you can see in this particular patient with lung cancer, the number of cells, the number of CTCs per mil in this case was quite high, 170 CTCs per mil. On average, we're closer to 20 to 50, but you're now at one. So once the number of cells is high enough, you can see what happens with treatment. And you can see here in blue is the tumor volume as measured on a CAT scan with effective therapy for lung cancer. In red are the number of CTCs declining quickly. So clearly what we can show now with patients with metastatic disease is that when we capture enough CTCs, we can show how quickly they respond to effective therapy. Now, the challenges with this chip were all in the, um, in the, in the scale-up and the advanced engineering of it. Uh, basically, this kind of chip can be made lovingly. You can make two or three or four per week. Then you need a vacation. So we tried to ramp up generation of this chip primarily to allow the types of clinical trials that many people in this room would love to do. We were able to ramp up the generation of the silicon chip. 
we can do so much with sample processing and imaging, but the key problem was, was chemical functionalization. And it turns out that a really, really good chip captures really well and has low background, and a bad chip captures poorly and has high background. And as we started scaling up a complex chip, such as this MicroPost device that I've shown you, it became more and more of a challenge to maintain the quality of the chips that we needed for this kind of work. And thereby, we ended up with Generation 2. Generation, generation 2 is what we call the next generation or the herringbone chip. And again, the idea is that if you can make a simple chip, you might be able to scale it up more effectively as well as increase processing. The engineering device here is, again, if you have cells going through a little channel, they don't touch anything. But instead of putting posts inside there to disrupt the flow, what you can do is generate irregularities. They're called herringbones or, um, or uh, in basically wedges or ridges within the upper wall of the chamber, which then triggers a turbulent flow. And what happens then is you get waves of turbulent flow, and the cells, as they go through this channel, are forced either up or down, and they come into contact with the antibody-coated surfaces. So this actually works very, very well, and there are a number of important advantage, advances. First of all, it's easier to chemically functionalize, and you can ramp up the number of chips that you can make. Secondly, the imaging is much improved. And thirdly, you can make these substances out of plastic or transparent materials, so you can now stain the cells and look at them with standard approaches. This is what it looks like. You can see it's transparent. Again, you can stain the cells in fluorescent um, stains, and these are these herringbone devices. And you can see here, these are just representative uh, images in, from, from prostate cancer CTCs. In this case, we're staining with nuclei, prostate-specific membrane antigen, white cell markers, and we can merge these images. And you can, again, see a kind of resolution of what these cells are like in patients with prostate cancer um, and other cancers as well. And this was all done by Shannon Stott, a postdoc in Mematona's lab. Now you can see, again, we can now stay, we can, not only you can see these cells, you can see in some cases the tumor cells are larger than the white blood cells, and that's quite dramatic. In other cases, they're actually smaller. Uh, you can see great resolution here in terms of um, ugly looking nuclei. And we can now do H&E stains, so we can match the immunofluorescence stain with H&E and see exactly what the cells look like, which is particularly important if we're not always sure about the stains that we're using and, and evolution in tumor biology such as EMT. Now, the catch is that it's actually quite difficult to image cells in three-dimensional space, especially if there's nothing next to them to focus with. So Shannon has spent a tremendous amount of time optimizing and standardizing this. Initially, this was all done manually by looking at, through, the, through a microscope for about eight hours in a row, identifying these cells. Now we have a semi-automated uh, platform, which, again, still takes about two to four hours to scan each chip, but it does it with you not in the room. And there are a number of criteria. As you can see, and I'll talk more about this, we've applied PSA staining, but you can do a number of different stains. You can look to make sure that the stains identify the same cell in three-dimensional space. You can put um, you can quantify thresholds for what's considered a positive stain. Again, when you're doing digital imaging, anything can be positive for anything. So you need to be very careful about your thresholds. Make sure that the cells and nuclei are round, that the center of staining is ex exactly the same. And again, look at a number of different criteria so that it's reproducible from one analysis to the next. So let me now give you some um, clinical insights, in, at least in terms of the three points that I was going to make. In metastatic cancer, most of our studies have been in lung cancer, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. But as you know and as you've heard, we've had kind of a fascination with EGFR mutant lung cancer, a non-smoker's lung cancer defined by activating mutations in EGFR kinase. This is particularly interesting because there are very specific mutations that you can screen. So in red are the um, acquired somatic mutations which confer sensitivity to EGFR kinase inhibitors. And in blue, or supposed to be in blue, it's in black, is the gatekeeper mutation, which is the most common acquired drug resistance mutation. So the good news here is that there's a defined number of mutations that we can look for, which makes it relatively easy to look for these in minimal amounts of material. And this is a trial that was led by Shamala Maheswaran and by Alicia Sequist. And what you can see here is that we captured cells uh, from patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer. We either analyzed them with this DXS assay, which is a real-time PCR assay, 
or in one case, there were enough cells and they were pure enough that we could do direct sequencing of DNA lysed from the cells and show these mutations. So on average, we looked at 23 patients. As you can see, we got about 74 CTCs per mil. And this is published, so I'll go this, through this relatively quickly. But in 12 cases, for 11 of them, we could identify the correct mutation that was known from the tumor in the blood. And the only case that we missed was a case where the mutation was actually not represented in the DXS kit that we were using. So again, we could not possibly have detected that. In our hands, that was significantly more effective than just doing free plasma DNA. But again, both technologies are developing quite quickly. The interesting observation was that what we found, and I'll again summarize this relatively quickly, some patients had no drug resistance mutations detectable at all before treatment, but others actually had these mutations present at very, very low levels. And what we found, in fact, was that those who had none of the drug resistance mutations at the time of development will sometimes develop them during the course of therapy, but they had an average response rate of about a year. Those in whom you could find a very, very low number or low frequency of drug resistance mutations present before the drug was actually given had a shorter, closer to six months uh, duration of response. And then the most unexpected finding was the fact that at the end of therapy, after multiple rounds of chemotherapy, when things were getting more difficult in terms of disease progression, we started finding new mutations which had not been detectable at the time of early disease. Again, pointing, I think, to an important fact that the more effective our therapies are, the more we impact the tumor itself, and the more we have to know how it evolves and how it responds to our treatments. This is um, a collection of four patients who were followed for over a year, and again, what you can see here in green is the tumor volume as measured by x-ray or by CAT scan. In red, the number of CTCs coming down and then after a year coming up again. And again, at every one of these stages, we could genotype the tumor. And in this case, for example, we found a deletion mutation that was common and a subtle hint of this drug resistance mutation. By the time the tumor had become resistant, it was an equimolar ratio of these two mutations. Now, this again is, I, I leave to you as a platform for further type of adaptation to molecular targeted therapies, and again, something which we're very, very interested in pursuing. Let me switch to some kind of more futuristic type applications, which I think are not yet proven in terms of whether the, te the technology can take us there, but I think have tremendous potential as well. And that's the idea of can we use this kind of technology? Are we good enough? Is the technology sensitive enough that we can start applying it to patients with localized cancer? And for this, we actually turn to prostate cancer for a number of reasons, one of which is that there's a tremendous need in prostate cancer. The primary tumor is multifocal. The, uh, metast the metastatic tumor develops multiple years after that, and it's in the bone, so you can't really biopsy it. So there's very much a need to monitor prostate cancer. In addition, prostate cancer has been blessed with PSA. So you can argue back and forth whether a keratin positive cell in your blood is from the skin or from your thyroid or from your tumor, but if it's PSA positive, it's not from your thyroid. So this is what we focused on. And again, we've done this. The data that I'll show you was first done with generation one chip and then done with generation two chip. This was generation one chip. And you can see now that we could adapt this on this log scale healthy females had no PSA positive cells except for one cell in one person. But in healthy males, we, were, we did see, depending on how you set the gain, up to 10 cells per mil in the, as the higher, the higher bar here for the threshold in, in, in healthy individuals. When we look at patients, and this is all comers, localized, advanced, on hormone res, um, responsive or hormone re refractory, we saw, again, on this log scale, significant amount of signal in terms of the cells that we could identify. And again, if you follow patients with metastatic disease and you treat them with hormone ablation, in this case Lupron, you see a very rapid drop in the number of CTCs um, that corresponds very well with the drop in serum PSA levels. Again, uh, in both our lung cancer studies and our prostate cancer studies, there's no correlation between the bulk of tumor as measured by PSA or by X-ray at presentation and the number of CTCs. So CTCs are may, may be measuring the amount of tumor, but they measure something else in addition, perhaps vascular invasiveness, perhaps other things. So across patients, these don't correlate at all. But within a given patient, what we see every time is when there's effective therapy, the number of CTCs drops dramatically. When the therapy is not effective, we don't see much of a change. 
Now, we did some molecular analysis here. As you know, this is the Arulchinean translocation, tempus to erg. We can actually isolate enough uh, high-quality RNA from CTCs to be able to amplify the translocation and sequence it. And here's an interesting observation, which is that when we looked at the primary tumor from uh, prostate cancers, the localized primary tumor, about 50 percent, 45 percent, had the tempus to erg translocation in their primary colon, in their primary prostate cancer. When we looked on average of three to five years later when they had metastatic disease, we had the same number, about 50 percent had CTCs that were positive for the translocation, but the concordance was only 70 percent. So we had significant number of patients in whom you could find the translocation present among the many foci of primary prostate cancer, but the clone that became dominant when they had metastatic disease was not one of the ones that had this translocation, and again, the converse is true. Pointing again the need to know what you're treating at the time that you're treating it. Now, the most exciting result for us was when we um, set up this collaboration. This was done by Rick Lee of Medical Oncology and with a urologist, Doug Dahl, who is uh, one of the, the great practitioners of laparoscopic uh, prostate resections. We looked at 19 patients who had localized prostate cancer. So these were patients who had a nodule, they had PSA, they had localized disease, and they were sent to a urologist to have their prostate removed. So it turned out that 11 of these 19 patients had no CTCs before or after surgery. So you can see in red, the serum PSA was present, and then after surgery, day one, day eight, and then a, a two to three months, for all these tests were limited to the kind of previously scheduled clinical visits. So there were no CTCs, the PSA dropped as expected. There was a second set of patients, about eight patients, who actually did have CTCs present at the time that they had localized disease. And then in the majority of those, when we looked at day one after surgery, the CTCs were gone. And then in most cases, they stayed down. So again, this tells us that there's a subset of patients who actually have CTCs at the time of diagnosis with what is thought to be localized disease, and they disappear after the, surgery, after the prostate is taken out. It confirms very nicely that the CTCs come from the prostate. It suggests that at least in these cases, the half-life of CTCs in the circulation is less than 24 hours. And then there are some that we can't figure out. There was a handful of patients in whom there were CTCs before surgery, and they kind of persisted. Some persisted for one day. Some, not shown here, persisted for a month. And after that, they all went down to nothing. So these patients have now been followed for, for a year. None of them have recurred yet. But there were definitely patients who had CTCs for a short period of time after the prostate was gone. We, have no, we had no idea what was going on until we presented this at a GU meeting, and people said, well, obviously, we know what's going on. These are aggressive prostate, primary prostate cancers that have seeded some other site, potentially the bone marrow, potentially other places, and eventually, they burn out, whether there are no cancer stem cells or whether this is something that happens, we don't know. But there could be a temporary source of circulating cells in the vasculature after the primary tumor has gone out. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have metastatic cancer. And to us, that's the most exciting observation. So our conclusions would be that, we can, that the half-life of CTCs in the circulation is probably less than 24 hours if, it's the on, if, if, the organ, if, if you take out the one organ that's the source of these. But it really suggests that what you might be able to measure in some patients is vascular invasion into the circulation before you've set up CTCs. And that really almost suggests a second model. The initial model was that CTCs are incredibly rare. You only find them late in advanced disease, so they're not really that they're interesting, but they're not really that helpful. The model that we would like to pursue, we have not, you've seen the data for it, so it's clearly a very early model, but the suggestion might be that vascularly invasive primary tumors could set up CTCs in the, in the circulation relatively early in the course of cancer. You could have CTCs in the blood way before any of them actually give rise to a bona fide metastasis. If that turns out to be true, again, it's a big if, and if we have the technology to pick them up, then the, the future of early detection in these kinds of cancers would be very, very high. Now that I have you kind of hallucinating this great future for CTCs, let me kind of take you over the edge. Um, biological insights. I'm just going to show you two things that we're focused on now, and I won't show you the third, uh, but tell you about the third. The first is that the herringbone chip, the, the herringbone chip doesn't have these pillars, so it's even lower shear. 
And what we found, which we had never found before, were clusters of tumor cells in the circulation. What you're looking at here is, again, a patient with advanced prostate cancer. In green is PSMA, so it's a prostate stain. In red are these contaminating white cells. And here next to it is the same image shown with H&E. And what we can find in a subset of patients with advanced metastatic cancer are clumps, two, three, four. This one has about 12 tumor cells stuck together. They're not, we don't believe, artifacts of the collection because we don't see them with cell lines. We don't see with them with patients who have lots and lots of CTCs. It's not correlated with the number of CTCs, but we find them in prostate cancer. We find them in lung cancer. And it raises this fascinating question. The model that we use is the EMT model. Cells are epithelial. They become mesenchymal. They move around as individual cells go into the blood space move out of the blood space, become epithelial again, and give rise to a tumor. That's been modeled in mouse. It really isn't really well defined in human cancers. This other model, which again could coexist or not, is that you have clumps or you have lumps of cells that somehow detach from a tumor, go through the vascular space, and then land somewhere. Um, again, if, if you have questions, I can, I can talk about the staining intensity. But one thing we've noticed is that the quality of the stain and by inference, the viability of these cells seems to be much better when they are in these kind of clusters than when they are in individual cells. But again, that's still for the future. The other thing that I wanted to show you um, is this, which is that we can now start to ask quest deeper questions of CTCs. What you're looking at here is a stain for KI67. So again, two prostate cells, two nuclei, they both stain for PSA. This one stains red, this one does not. So one of those two cells is in cycle and is positive for KI67, the other one isn't. And for the first time now, the imaging and the, the reagents are sufficient to, for us to ask the question of what fraction of these cells are cycling, what's the proliferative index of CTCs. And in very early studies, if we look at castration sensitive, so these are newly diagnosed prostate cancers being treated with hormone therapy, we can see lots of CTCs in some cases, but the average proliferative index is around 1%. It's really, really low. And in a small subset of patients with castrate resistance, so very refractory prostate cancer, sometimes we see fewer numbers of CTCs, but the proliferative index is much higher. And in fact, that 7% relates to someone who is being treated with an aromatase inhibitor. The ones who are being treated with Taxol are closer to the 50 to 70% in this small series. So again, now we can look at proliferative index as a subset of CTCs, raising the question that we don't really want to know the total number of CTCs. We want to know who are the bad guys among that crowd, and it could be a very small subset. So let me end with the uh, major goals of CTC type analyses is real-time genot real genotyping to help in terms of novel therapies, detection of invasive disease, and then figuring out what these guys are. Major efforts now in the lab are to try to release these in a viable way so that we can see how many of them will actually grow in tissue culture, and then applying next generation type strategies to figure out how are they different from cells, what do they express, what kind of abnormalities that they have. And all of this work is supported to a great part by Stand Up to Cancer as well. We have uh, four collaborating institutions, MIT, Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, and Sloan Kettering, and we're hoping by April of next year to be able to release this technology to these collaborating institutions to have them do their trials as well. So this has been a great collaborative work uh, between uh, our group led by Shamla Maheswaran and by myself at MGH with most of the work um, on prostate cancer led by David Miyamoto, Rick Lee, Doug Dow, and Chin Lee Wu of pathology in lung cancer, Michael Rothenberg, Leisha Sequist, and a great collaboration with the bioengineering group led by Mehmet Toner with uh, Suni postdoc Sunita Negrath with the first generation chip and Shannon Stott for the second generation chip. Thanks very much. Okay, questions from down? Two brief questions. Can you reply to like any flows of material and yet run on your chips? This is like for like maybe future studies. And the other one is that how did you find a healthy patient? That you had a slide in which you had healthy controls with um, detectable number of CTCs. So the, the second question first, uh, most of the healthy controls were healthy young volunteers, sometimes blood bank samples as well. We now are starting a trial at MGH in the primary care clinic to test patients who are of the same age range as patients, so more closer to, closer to the relevant population 
uh, who have no known cancer to see what the true baseline is in the population. To your first question, no, one of the problems of this approach is that we have to use fresh material. So what happens if you let the blood sit for say overnight, you still capture the cells, but the white cells start to aggregate. So the amount of background and non-specific binding becomes quite high. We're working on ways of doing various fixations of cells so that they can be transported. But again, that has a big impact on the microfluidic properties. So that's a challenge for the future. Uh, patenting technology, have you done this uh, on other body materials, such as CSF fluid or even urine or some other sources of different, other than serum or blood? We, we've, we've talked about it and have not done that yet. Um, We've, we've talked about ascites as well. One, one of the issues, of course, is clotting in devices, et cetera. So, so far, we've only focused on blood, but it could be applied elsewhere. One of the issues, that you can also measure not CTCs, but so-called disseminated tumor cells and by doing bone marrow analyses of patients. We've been very focused on the idea that true success here is the fact that this is not invasive and it's just a blood test. So that's been our main emphasis. But theoretically, it should work on anything. Have you tried to correlate your findings with the EMT? Um, so the, the challenge with EMT is that if we induce EMT in cell lines, and we induce it really well, EPCAM goes down and we can no longer capture these cells. So we know that if EMT is right, we can't capture them with EPCAM. What we are doing, because we can play with antibodies, is we use non-EPCAM antibodies, EGFR, HER2, other antibodies for capture, and then we interrogate cells to try to figure out how many have, have or have not gone through EMT. It's too early to have any reliable results yet because EPCAM capture is still the best one that we have, but that's the way that we're going to try to tackle that. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, very interesting. I just have a two uh, kind of some way related questions. One, uh, um, EPCAM antibody clearly don't capture all the CTCs as they are in the blood. So I would just wonder if uh, there is any efforts to identify additional antibody that maybe can be using as a cocktail of antibody for fishing out more cells. And the second question, um, do you think that the category of tumor that don't produce much of CTC cells are actually those tumor that don't express absolutely EPCOM or indeed exist a set of cancer that don't shed? as CTC. Thank you. So to your second question, we don't know enough. If we don't see anything, there's so many reasons that we don't know if the biology is not there or the reagents are not there. Um, EPCAM is, again, the, the grandfather of all these antibodies, and we need to go beyond that. The problem with mesenchymal antibodies is that many of them are present in blood cells. And if you're starting with one in a billion cell, you don't have a chance if these things are shared. So we've gone primarily for lineage-type markers. So we're doing some studies in melanoma, we're doing studies in brain tumors, we're doing studies in sarcomas. Again, each time applying a specific marker rather than a global EPCAM type of capture. I think that maybe philosophically, the, the current technology is kind of on the edge of, with, um, with the Veridex platform, is not that sensitive. So there's been appeal to having one antibody to capture everything and one antibody to actually stain everything. As the technology gets better and better, there will be enough markets to make a prostate chip, a breast chip, or 17 different chips. You know, if, if Jose would like 25 different breast cancer chips, we'll make him 25 different chips. So I think if the technology works, then we'll be able to justify specific antibodies for specific questions. Last question. Do any of the uh, circulating cells have stem cell markers in prostate, for example, CD44, 133? So we started looking for stem cell markers. We don't have clear results yet. So they're not, the, major the majority of them clearly do not. Uh, whether there's a subset that does, we actually don't know yet. We've started applying these kinds of markers. Uh, but there, it, it, unofficially, it looks like it's going to be low, but we don't have enough uh, data to say that. Okay, Thank thanks you. very much, Don.